Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 15. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. Hey there, everybody. I am Jay Scott, co host of the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, here with my amazingly awesome and beautiful co host and wife, Miss Carol Scott. That was so sweet. Thank you, honey. How are you doing today, Carol Scott? I'm a little tired. I was up at, um, I actually, I have, to, I have to confess, I slept in today. I didn't get up until 3 30. I'm slacking. Slacking. 3.30 a.m. or p.m.? Are you kidding me? You've known me for 12 years. Clearly, we're at 3.30 a. What's well, better than three? I, I, I can empathize. I was up early this morning, too, I think. Oh, uh, what? I, were you up at nine? No, no. I was up at 8.30 this morning. Oh, I, I, yeah. I'm feeling really bad for you there, darling. I'm, I'm tired, but, but I won't complain. Yeah. Good, good strategy, my friend. So we have a really great show today, but before we jump into the show, uh, I know there's some people out there who may be interested in being a guest on the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. Yeah, we want you or some of the people in your network. So if you would like to be on our show, if you'd like to be considered or know someone else who would be great, go to biggerpockets.com slash bizguest. That's B-I-Z-G-U-E-S-T, biggerpockets.com slash bizguest. We'd love to hear what you're all about and see if you could be someone we could talk to. Awesome. Now, let's get into our show. We have a really awesome show today. We have a guy on the show. His name is Max Maxwell. For those who aren't familiar, Max is a real estate wholesaler. And for you non-real estate folks out there, we will talk about what a real estate wholesaler does. But Max has built a real estate investing business. He's doing upwards of $100,000 a month in income. He's built this business by putting in place systems, processes, hiring virtual assistants. Basically, he's put his real estate business on autopilot. And a lot of the tips that he gives today talks about not just how to put a real estate business on autopilot, but how to put any business on autopilot. And if you stick around towards the end of the interview, he gives some really good tips on negotiating uh, and a whole lot of other great stuff. So this is a fantastic show. I'm really excited to jump into this. So without any further ado, let's bring on Mr. Max Maxwell. Well, how you doing, Max? I'm doing well, sir. How you doing? I am doing great. We are thrilled to have you here. Hi, Max. Thanks so much for coming on with us today. I appreciate being here. This is awesome. Honey, how excited are you to have Max Maxwell? This is awesome. So I have listened to a lot of your podcasts. I've listened to some interviews you've done and you've really figured out, and and we're going to talk about this in the episode, but you've really figured out uh, the systems, the processes, the scaling of your business. And I know there are a lot of people who are listening to this who are looking to do the same thing. So I'm really excited about this episode. Can I tell you what else I'm excited about? Honey, have you seen Max Maxwell's signature? It is the coolest signature. It could totally be this freestanding brand. I just want it splashed across shirts and everywhere. Have you seen this? It's I amazing. have not seen this. We will make sure that goes in the show notes. Thanks. Awesome. My signature is really cool too. Yes, you See, have a great signature. Your signature also. is ridiculous. <laughs> My signature certainly needs some work. X. <laughs> totally lame. Max rocks the signature situation. Okay. Funny, funny story about that though, but yeah. we'll talk about it later. Okay. Perfect. So I want to start out with, so we have a really diverse audience. So we have a whole lot of real estate investors in our audience, but we also have a lot of people who aren't real estate investors. Uh, They're more generic business people or, or they're getting ready to start businesses outside of real estate. You are one of our hardcore real estate business owners and guests. So before we jump into your backstory and, and our business discussion, can you get a little, give us a little bit of information about your specific business niche? So you're a real estate wholesaler, and I know there are going to be some people who are listening to this that don't know what wholesaling is. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about what wholesaling is, what exactly that means? Yeah, I mean, it's really no different than wholesaling groceries or wholesaling cars or anything like that. We just decide to use real estate because the margins are a lot better and uh, everybody needs a house. But, but particularly, we get something, a house, uh, under contract at a certain price, and 
and uh, we either try to sell that contract or purchase it and sell it pretty much quickly right after we purchase it. So basically buying something low and selling it higher and we don't even deal with the retail side meant much. Uh, it's more of, you know, end to end business to business where we're selling directly to guys that are flipping properties or guys that are holding properties uh, for personal investment purposes. So you're basically playing the middleman. You're buying low, selling high, and just kind of doing an arbitrage play where you're making some money for the services you bring to both the seller and the buyer. I mean, in any business, and I think the way the world is going right now, the middleman is the guy that actually makes the most money. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that. Great. So Am I understanding correctly that you have managed to systematize your business to the point where you're making something like you're bringing in $100,000 each and every month wholesaling? At least, yeah. That's fantastic. I'm sure, I'm guessing that didn't happen overnight. So before we go into how you got there, I think this is really important that we hear your backstory, right? I'm guessing you had a first job at some point in your life. And maybe yeah. it was wholesaling house. I have a feeling it's not. So give us a little bit of backstory. Where, show us where the entre- entrepreneurialism came from, Max. Well, I don't know where it was born from, but I know like, you know, my uncle, who used to own real estate and he would show me around and I never understood how he owned so many houses. And ever since I was just young, like it was, it was a way of making your own money was going out at a young age. You know, I have immigrant parents, so I come from a very hardworking background of, of, of you know, thread of parents, and it just kind of was in me. But my first real job on the books outside from when I was younger. So when I was younger, before I had my first official job, I worked at a tree farm. Um, I did concrete, hard labor. Like, it, it was fun, though. My next door neighbor owned a concrete company, and I was able to work with him in the summer so I can buy my jet skis or whatever I wanted nice. to play with on the lake. Um, but my first job job where I actually collected money in W2 was the United States Air Force at 17 years old. Awesome. Do you fly planes? I actually do fly planes now, but I was not a pilot in the Air Force. I actually learned how to fly uh, maybe three years ago now. Oh, awesome. You do it recreationally as a hobby? Yeah, just uh, small, small towns, four-seater planes, just fly whenever I can. So this dude's got jet skis, he's got airplanes, you've got the life, man, you've got this figured out. And, 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 and notice he, uh, notice, tell us a little bit about that booth you're standing in now, you were just telling us before the show started. Yeah, so last year when I decided that content was a very important part inside of being a media, of being an entrepreneur, I decided to invest into a 5,000 square foot warehouse. It was actually 13,000, but we took 5,000 of it and made it into a, um, like a studio. So we have uh, a 20 by 20 psych wall, two podcast rooms, a set design area, a uh, edit bay. Um, Pretty much I could do, I could run a news broadcasting center out of here only because I understand that each company that I own and participate in has to be a media outlet themselves. So I just invested that myself. That's awesome. I'm going to get back to that. Okay. So let's go back to your story. You're in the Air Force. What's next? I was in the Air Force. I did my first uh, uh, four years and decided this wasn't for me. Uh, getting shot at for 20 grand wasn't really that fun. <laughs> so <laughs> I it would be. Not I met, living the dream. Yeah. I, I met some good people, some people that are friends now still with me, um, you know, but, you know, I, I wanted to do something different and I got out. And actually, I went right into real estate. And this was around 2004, 2005. And um, I got a real estate license as a broker and decided that was fun for the first year and a half. And then I decided that wasn't cool either. What Um, about it wasn't cool? I didn't didn't like driving people around on Saturdays and Sundays to buy a house that they never were intended to buy. Right. I hear you. It was a job. It was a terrible job. Um. I enjoyed it. I love what I learned. And I think that's the lesson. Everything that I did, I learned something that got me where I am today. And um, so I loved that real estate side. And then I opened up a property management investment company and I enjoyed that better. I enjoyed the numbers. I enjoyed finding something that was less value turned into something that was worth more and then making an investment property for somebody. So uh, flipping houses. Well, I, I, really I was doing the management side of it, but then I found one big guy that wanted me to actually assist him with flipping some of his properties. And I was kind of wholesaling and not really knowing what wholesaling was, but I was finding houses that were broken, fixing them and then giving it to him. 
as an investment portfolio property. Got it. So you started in real estate 2004, 2005, and that's kind of been your main business focus for the last uh, 14 years? No. Oh, no. there's more to the story. No. There's more. Yeah, 2008 happened and I thought real estate was dead. I left. I got out of the game and I didn't, re I didn't come back. I left in about 2008 when I moved to California and I didn't pick up real estate again until 2015. Wow. So, I want to go back to that too. Obviously we know, we know, we all know what happened back in yeah. 2008 on a mass level. Right. But I love hearing those nitty gritty stories. Was there, was there a single incident or a single week or a single month or a single something that was just so bad for you personally, so bad for you in real estate, so bad for you and your business with that was like, I am so out of here. What was the straw that broke that camel's back? Yeah. Big mistake. About 90 percent of my business was from one guy. It was a $13.5 million portfolio, all North Carolina property. So we're not in California. So $13.5 million in property is a lot of property. A out lot here of property. California. So I managed his entire portfolio. He was 90 plus percent of my business. And he seen the ball coming down the hill and he started selling. So I remember the day that he wanted to start dumping his portfolio. And that was the day I had to start laying people off that were on-site managers at department complexes and stuff like that. And it was just like, Wow, we're we're going downhill. No fun. Some really hard lessons learned yeah. there, right? Yeah, a, a lot of a lot of people don't realize. I mean, you can have the best customer in the world generating a ton of money for you, but when you are relying on one customer, that customer has control over your business. You no longer have control over your business. I didn't realize it at the time, but like I said, these lessons built who I am today. That's awesome. Okay, well, so good. I was just going to say, lessons built who you are today. And that said, we always like to, we love to talk about our failures, right? Even if it's nothing that we personally did intentionally, obviously that was a failure. There, there are failures, I think, every single day. We have a mini failure. We have bigger macro failures. And, and I want to get more into some of those later as we're talking more, but I think they're so crucial to building your business and not being afraid to try new things and just fail the heck out of all kinds of situations so you get new ones going on. Absolutely. I'm with that. So 2008, uh, your one big customer kind of goes away and you realize I have to move out of real estate. What was your, what was your next move? I didn't know. I, I went from riding a high horse, at least what I thought was a high horse at that time, to pretty much broke because I was living above my means. Um, I didn't see the end of the real estate coming. So, you know, at that age, at 21, 22, owning a company and doing well, I, got, I had everything I thought I, I needed. And when that collapsed, so did everything. I went from having everything to where my car was in repossession. What was everything, Max? Tell us, what was that lifestyle? What, was, what, what, what kind of lifestyle were you living at 21? I can travel on, a, I could take one-way flights to New York and go shopping and, and not worry about the day I was coming back. Um, I had multiple cars all on payments, which was stupid. I had, uh, I had, I had more fun than I worked. And uh, it, it caught up to me. <laughs> and it was all at once. It was boom, game over, yeah. right? Game, game over. over. What'd you do? Where'd you go? I packed up and moved to California, went to go sleep on my cousin's couch. Um, he played professional soccer in, in LA. And I just was like, I need a new beginning. So I went over there and lived for a little while. And then I started working in the marketing world. And that's kind of where I started to really find what I really loved was marketing. At okay. the end of the day, most of our businesses, you, you have to market and sell in order to survive. So I started doing um, what we call experiential marketing activations and setups for big companies like Verizon, Charboil, uh, Hershey's, Legos, and started doing their, uh, their activations and setting up their stuff and organizing their, their marketing for their experiential side of things. What is the experiential side of things? What are we talking? Give me an example from one of those companies you're talking about. Yeah. So it's like a couple of things. Uh, you can go as large as um, for Verizon. What we did was they had a sponsorship with college football and we did the, their activations at the games. So we would have, we would organize, okay, there's X amount of games this year. We're going to deploy X amount of people with tents and new vehicles and show off your branding, show off new products, all that type of stuff. So that all the way to state fairs, to, uh, you know, conventions and conferences, the large ones, all these guys had sponsorships. So we would, we would be their experiential side, their experience side with their customer. 
Great. So it sounds like you are getting in front of a lot of people, building relationships with a lot of people, building rapport with a lot of people yep. to ultimately activate those customers. Does that sound about right? Absolutely. I'm capturing that correctly. So how did you take that and translate it into your next move? So my next move was I realized a big funnel in this world. We would deploy, we would have a $14 million budget from Verizon and we would go from state fair to uh college football games and we needed what they call brand ambassadors to work that weekend event um and we were hiring them from craigslist and no we kidding and facebook groups so it was you had this 14 million dollar budget and then you're hiring people from craigslist to represent a, a billion dollar brand and that was a bottleneck so i created a company called fastbo which means fast brand ambassador and it was a tech it was an app where it was a marketplace app where essentially where we would go sign up all the brand ambassadors in the world and we would go get all the marketing companies that needed on-demand staffing and we would merge them and make the price in the middle. Once again, trying to be in the middle. Mm -hmm. And we would earn between two and four dollars an hour over thousands of employees every single weekend. And um, we got the app about 95% built, was in beta testing and we couldn't get funding in North Carolina. So all of my money, all of my credit cards, I'm, ex I'm all out now. Again. How much did you have invested in that project? I think personally I had around $30,000, which was oh. a lot of money to me. And then wow. I had another 60000 in investments from outside investors. So we were at $90,000, which wasn't nowhere not the right amount of money to build an app. And then we fail. And I hit rock bottom again. And you're in your mid-20s at this point, right? I am, I am pushing 30. You're pushing 30. 30. You're getting really old. You're yeah. getting like <laughs> ancient. Social security like about to kick in. You know? <laughs> all of it. All of it. To mega failures. You're almost 30. Oh, no. End of the world. Yeah. I How thought are you it feeling was. that time around? You're like, oh, my gosh. It felt like it. I was at a point where, once again, I didn't, have a, I didn't even have a car that had a payment on it. Thank God. I had a 2004 Volkswagen with a bad starter. And at 30 years old, I had to move back in home with my mom. Okay. So and you went from living with your, on your cousin's couch to being on your mom's couch. How's your mom like that? How is, how is your mom feeling about the whole situation? The mom and me's got to ask, how do you cope with that? Well, I, my, my, my mom was happy to see me, right? Because I've been gone for so long. At, Come on I mean, home, honey. Yeah. I we'll really left home you. at 17. I'll make you cookies. There you go. You know, she's, <laughs> she's a Jamaican mother, so she loves to cook food. Um, but you know, there was a point where I, I lived in my, I went rock bottom. I went to go live on my cousin's couch in LA. Uh, I got, I built myself back up, riding back a high horse, quit a nice paying W2 job, just create a company, create that company. I hit rock bottom again. And now I have to go back to a, a couch. Well, not a couch, but my mother's house. So, and there I'm at bottom again. So Max, why, why didn't you just get a job? Why do you keep starting companies? Why don't you just go, like, why don't you just go work a job, dude? Like, how hard is this? I don't know. It's, it's something in me. I think that's a question that a lot of people can't. I'm just unemployable. You know, I, I, I don't fit the mold of what, where I should be. Like, I, don't, I didn't go to college. I barely graduated high school. So if you look at my resume, I don't fit in where I'm actually capable of doing. Like, I can, I can turn companies around, but I, my resume doesn't say so. So I, I want to touch on something, and I saw it in your backstory uh, doing some research. Uh, you had mentioned that you're dyslexic. Mm -hmm. Big time. And so I imagine that that's caused struggles throughout your life as well and, and made things difficult. One of the things I've found is that people who have these struggles that are thrust upon them, whether it's a learning disability or it's a... Um, uh, um, something in their, in their childhood, whatever it is, they're not, they, they're forced to take a path where they're not following the rules and they get accustomed to not following the rules. And essentially we as entrepreneurs, that's what we are. We're people who don't want to follow the rules. And I, I found what that is. exactly, <laughs> exactly. I think I've heard of that word. And, and so the reason I bring up the dyslexia thing um, is I have a good friend, one of the best entrepreneurs I know, and he's dyslexic. And mm -hmm. he once said to me that if he hadn't have had dyslexia, had he gone, done well in high school, gone to college, zero chance he would have been an entrepreneur. He'd be sitting in an office right now behind a desk working a nine to five job. And so I think what a lot of people don't realize is these struggles that we face oftentimes give us opportunities that 
normal people don't yeah. get or they don't take advantage of. So, so they're really a blessing in disguise. I agree a hundred percent. It, 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 it gave me, a, I had a weakness on one side, but it gave me a strength on the other side. Yep. And dyslexic for most people that don't know is I, I see numbers and letters backwards. I, you can clearly tell me, I can literally read something on the screen. And when I say it, it's, I say it backwards. Um, so one thing I, I do, I picked up when I was younger, I found out I was dyslexic in high school, but one thing I picked up is I actually read people's lips. So whenever you're talking to me and if you're face to face, you'll notice that I'm staring at your mouth. I can literally see the words coming out of your mouth, like literally in physical form. I can see them come out of your mouth and it helps me like get the conversation straight. Cause if not, I will hear things that you didn't say in sense of like in order. And, and you know what I love? I love the fact that a lot of people I, we could be talking to right now would be, they would have started their story with, I was dyslexic and that's an excuse for this an excuse for that. You don't even mention it. Nope. Not even yeah. a thing. You, you, you it have doesn't this, define you. Yeah. Something, something that would stop a lot of us from even trying to mm -hmm. achieve business success. And you don't even mention it. Like it's not a big deal. I love that. Yeah, I, I, I don't mention it because I don't think about it. It's something I bring up and I told people because I know there's other people out there that struggle with it that really don't like to tell. I didn't read my first book till I was 30. Dyslexia stopped that. You know, it, it, it made me, I did not read a book from cover to cover till I was 30 years old, right? So that was four years ago. And that, that uh, I, I think that's good and bad. I, I mean, I, I love it though. I, I think it's great that I didn't read my first book to 30 because when I read it, I was ready to receive the information that was in it. And that book changed my life. That is yeah. awesome. What was the book? We've got to know. It's cliche, but it's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That story right. in the book. Yep. gave me the idea that I, w it gave me the thought that I was thinking about everything the wrong way. Okay. So you shifted your mindset because of that book. Yeah. It was just like, Hey, look at it different, look at things different. And when I did, it made me click. So with all my past failures and experiences and then reading that book, it started to have me piece things together and look, stop looking at the failures as failures and as lessons. Sure. So it almost gave you, it almost gave you permission, right? To, to like take those experiences, those quote unquote failures you had before, look at them in a different way and be like, wait a minute here. I'm just going to take that, shift my mindset about how this is happening and rock out a new thing. There you go. So what was the new thing? Uh, real estate. Yes. <laughs> and I was broke. I didn't have any money. Um, so a friend of mine, uh, his dad is in real estate and I went to his house. We were having a conversation and he was talking about how he became financially independent through real estate. And for me, it was still didn't click because of like, how can I get there? I'm not bankable. I'm not financeable. How does this happen? And he mentioned the word wholesaling and how you can pretty much sell things without actually owning the object, but controlling it without any money. And I was like, so I went home and three weeks, I went to YouTube University. And I call YouTube University, it's just like, you become obsessed with something, right? You can use YouTube for two things. You can go down a dark hole of <laughs> with cat videos, or you can use it to literally get a quick lesson from Harvard uh, that quick. I mean, there's actually Harvard videos on there, classroom videos there on are. YouTube. There's everything. I tell, I tell, I'll, I'm, I didn't interrupt you, but I, I tell so many I hate to date myself, but I tell so many like younger people and stuff. And I'm like, you are all born into this amazing, amazing, amazing time. Like I listen to Jay's 94 year old grandmother tell me all the time. She's like, you have no idea. I can't comprehend any of this. And I'm like, well, you know what? I can't comprehend everything that's happened even, even over the past 10 years. There's, there are just so many incredible tools yeah. and resources available now. So it's awesome that you were able to dive in there and, graduate from YouTube University and really get educated on this new venture. There, there's yeah. really no excuse not to be able to, uh, to get started in anything you want to get started in. And I, th I think that's, that's the lesson here that um, there's enough free information out there that people don't need to go to business school. People don't need to have a business mentor. People don't need to spend a ton of money on coaches. Yeah. Uh, just go get started. Go do it. And I think that's the main thing. Cause so, why I tell people that you don't need a mentor? And I don't mean you don't ever need a mentor because I have mentors. Of course. I mean, you don't need a mentor to get started because people use that barrier of, oh, I need a coach, I need a mentor 
to not do anything when reality is you just need to know the first step. Don't worry about step 10, get going. And I learned how to drive for dollars, which is simply riding around and looking for abandoned properties and finding the owner and calling them and see if they want to sell it. Absolutely. And that costs nothing except for a tank of gas. Absolutely. That, that's how you started your wholesaling business. Yes. Just started that's getting started. your car. I went to an old neighborhood. Dollars. Okay. So now a lot of people in this business, in the wholesaling business, I meet a lot of wholesalers um, mm -hmm. and they get to the point where they're doing a deal a month or two deals a month or even three or four deals a month. And they are ecstatic. They feel like they've made it. They, they're, they're, they're maxed out. They're maybe working 20, 30, 40, 60 hours a week. And they're just like, I made it. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep making money. And, and that's what they do forever. At some point you decided this isn't enough. I need yeah. to grow this business. I need to turn it. I need to take it from a hobby or, or it, kind of this, this investing thing I'm doing and turn it into a real business to scale it. So what was it in you that, that kind of led you down that path to, I want to turn this into a real business. And what did you start doing to, to achieve that? So one of my mentors that, that the one that actually introduced me or just said the word wholesaling, he told me to have a goal because what, what I, the, per, the picture I first seen is that he owns over 200 doors and he's, and he doesn't have to be, he, he doesn't, he doesn't need anything. He can be done and just relax for the rest of his life. And he gave me a statistic how if a hundred people start working at the age of 25, by the time they turn 65, only 1% are considered wealthy, which is like $5.7 million in net worth. Yep. 4% can take care of themselves. Right. That means they don't need social security. They don't need any government assistance. Yep. And the other 95% are either dead or depend on friends, family, or government assistance to live. It, it's, it's horrible. Staggering. <laughs> so that, that statistic tells you that I need to build wealth. Yes, a, uh, wholesaling is an ATM machine. It's just a job. It, wholesaling, yes, I have a business, but it starts over every month at zero. Right? Yes. Um, so I needed to learn how to build wealth. So he told me, look, you need to put goals in. You're doing a lot of volume. You need to start buying properties and getting the tax benefit of that and then start cre creating that passive income. Right now you have a very active income. And yes. that's when he said, come up with a goal for every seven houses you wholesale buy one. And that's how we started last year. And it's just become a, a rippling effect. So basically your wholesaling business is the, the feeder to your wealth building business, which is your, your rental properties. My wholesaling business is a very high paying W2 job that I don't know how long it will last, but if I'm smart with it and with the money that it brings, then I can create passive wealth for a long time. You're trading your time for dollars. And as soon as you stop putting in your time, you stop getting the dollars. And that's, that's where the rental properties come in. You put in the time, the effort once and, and the dollars just pay an annuity forever and ever. Correct. I would like to know, Max, back when you were, when you were really doing this by yourself, take us through a typical deal, right? Take us through what that process looked like. Maybe even what some of those numbers look like. Mm -hmm. And that, so start with that and then build up to how you shifted things, how things changed and systematized so you could begin growing. So go back to that when you were doing it by yourself, what that, what one of those deals look like, how that worked. Yeah. So typically, uh, so I, I'll go back to my first deal. Um, we bought a house. I put a house under contract. Let me say that. I put a house under contract with the intention to buy and then sold my, sold my uh, equitable interest for $14,000. And I, that was my proof that this is real. And so I started doing that by myself on a regular. And what that looked like on a day to day is I would make 200 phone calls every single day, a hundred in the, in the morning and 100 in the afternoon and the you, evening. You yourself yeah. would make 200 phone calls in a day? On my cell phone. How, ah, that makes my head hurt thinking about that. How many, how many hours a day were you realistically working making those 200 phone calls? Um, so in the morning time, I would start like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, start making phone calls, right? Because I want to catch certain people before they get to work. Certainly. Right? And then, so I did that all the way till like 11 because I want to catch people when they're, wa when they're watching prices right and all that stuff as well. <laughs> and then between like 12 and two, I would do my research. And that's why I would spend my time at the courthouse, in the probate, in the taxes. And I was really educating myself and really putting the pieces of the puzzle of 
problems because we're in a problem solving business. So I need to find out where the problems were. So I was in the divorce room and the probates room and the bankruptcy rooms trying to figure out what problems can I solve. And that's when I started collecting data between the time of like 12 and two. And then after two, I would come home, compress this data, put it on Excel sheets to be skipped out at night when I was sleeping and started at around five o'clock. I would call from like 5 p.m. to 830 at night. And that's where I would do my hundred there, hundred there. Now, do I talk to talk to 200 people a day? No, I would probably reach around 40 people a day, right? 30 to 40 people a day, whether they told me to go kick rocks or yes, I'm interested in selling the house. As long as I got 40 people that owned a property on the phone that said no, yes or no, I was happy because I started to build up this pipeline. And as I consistently did that, I started to realize I was building this pipeline and then I would get callbacks and then the follow-ups came where I would call somebody that I talked to three weeks ago that said maybe, or that they would think about it. I would call them now and they would be more inclined. And then another conversation in two days and then the next day and then, Oh, an appointment. And then, Oh, I got this house. So it would work like that in succession. So I was working when I first got my first check and I started working like crazy. I actually had to wear night, a night guard in my mouth because I did not want to go to sleep. It was, I was dreaming and, and gritting my teeth at night, wanting to, I wanted 7.30 to hit so fast so I could start making phone calls again for the next day because I knew that one yes was like 10 grand. And I was getting shot at for $20,000 a couple years ago. So you got to understand the difference is that I can make a phone call for 10 or get shot at for 20. Kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is a common theme uh, among the guests that we're talking to. It, it really is. It's about consistency. Mm-hmm. And there, there's a saying in, in business and entrepreneurship, 90% of success is just showing up. And it's, it's amazing how doing the same thing day in and day out, mm-hmm. the first day, no results. Second day, no results. Third day, no results. I, I often tell people, I meet two types of people in the real estate business. I meet 95% of people who they've never done a deal and they'll never do a deal. I mean, mm-hmm. zero deals. That's, that's, that's their, their reality in real estate. The other 5% are going to do 10, 20, 50, a hundred, a thousand deals. I never meet anybody in this business that does one deal because if you have the motivation, if you have the work ethic, if you have the, the, the commitment mm-hmm. to do one deal, that deal is going to take you a while. But as soon as you do that first deal, you're going to get to the second much quicker. You're going to get to the third, to the fifth, to the 50th or the hundredth that much quicker. And so I, I think you said this a lot more concisely than I did, but it's really, it's just showing up, doing the work day in and day out and letting the snowball form and not giving up before it does. Correct. And, and that's why I say you're one deal away. I use that term a lot. Love that. And it means that you're not going to gain financial freedom from that first deal but you're going to prove to yourself and maybe others that have been doubting you that this is real and you are now going to try to do this over and over again, make it repeatable. And now you changed everything you knew about time and money for the rest of your life. That's great. Yes. Okay. So, so you're doing deals now and Mm -hmm. you've realized I can make $10,000 a deal. I can make $14,000 a deal like you did on your first deal. Mm -hmm. And at some point you decide that's not enough. I don't want to make 200 calls a day, even though I might be making 10 or 20 or $30,000 a month. Mm -hmm. That's not enough for me. I need to do something different. I want to do more. I want to do bigger. And so what did that look like to you? When did you, when did that kind of that mindset set in that, that I can scale this thing? Yeah. So that's when I kind of started my YouTube channel and I wanted to hold myself accountable. So the first thing after reading books and listening to podcasts, because during this whole time, I'm still educating myself because I don't know anything. I really don't know anything. I just know enough to where I made some few dollars. I started educating myself and the first, I heard somebody say, I don't know who it is. So I don't know who to give credit, but they said, fire yourself from something that you don't like to do or you're not that great at. And I fired myself from collecting the data right? And, and doing the Excel sheet and, and, and all that stuff. So at first hire I had was a remote employee from the Philippines, which I lucked up on. She's still with me today. Um, and she did all my Excel, all my data collection from online and everything and did it while I was sleeping so that when I wake up in the morning, I no longer had to do that before I got started making the phone calls. When I wake up, I can now start dialing. 
Great. And I think that's, I want to touch on that a little bit more for all people in any type of business, right? I think it's, you said something that your, your coach or your mentor told you that you said was fire yourself from something you're not good at. Would you agree? And, and honey, do, I, I know you and I still, still to this day, even with all of our businesses, everything that we've done, we still struggle with this. As, as people, it's sometimes just hard to identify and admit there are some things I'm just not good at, right? You even remember back in the day when we started- you tell me all the stuff I'm not good at all the oh, time. Oh, I'm so good at telling you all the stuff you're not good at. I'll tell you that all day long. But you remember back in the day when we started our businesses, right? Like you remember when we would just, I would do something and then you would decide you were just as good at that. So you would redo it. And then I'd go in and then I would redo what you just redid and, you know, back and forth. And it turns out neither of us were good at it. And neither <laughs> of us were good at what we weren't good at, but we just had a hard time realizing that was the case. Yeah. So. I think it's, it's, I just think it's super important, no matter what type of mis business that you're in, realizing there are things that you just are not a pro at and figuring out a way to supplement that. And it sounds like you supplemented that with, um, with your assistant in the Philippines who crunches your data. Yeah. And, and one thing I would say is before you completely outsource it, at least understand it, understand it enough to where you can teach it. Um, because if not, you're just passing through chaos, right? Just because you hire somebody that is supposed to crunch your data doesn't mean they know how to do it exactly the way you want it or were doing it prior. Sure. So, so learn it. Don't got to be good at it, but learn right. it. Know what, know what it's about. Where did you find your person? Where, where do people find these people once, mm -hmm. once they do learn what needs to be happening? Where do they find people to do it? I found my virtual assistant on Upwork. Upwork, Okay. And she turned out to be a rock star. She yeah. was actually like the hiring manager at a large call center in the Philippines. And then from that day forward, anytime I needed a new person on the team, she would go out and hire them. So that's a great process within a process right there. <laughs> so while you're building out your systems and processes, you are systematizing and process it. You're systematizing your processes around hiring more people mm -hmm. through your virtual assistant that yep. you got through Upwork. So yep. you're this point, you're really realizing the value in systematizing everything to scale. Mm -hmm. So I, at this point now, I've fired myself from collecting the data. And now I can focus on doing things in those three hours in the day where I was going to collect data, three to four hours. I am now doing more marketing, whether that's on Craigslist, on Facebook. We started putting out bandit signs. And the bandit sign started a uh, in-call volume, right? So now I'm getting calls that I can't even answer. I'm starting to sh like filter my customers through listening to their voicemail if they're motivated or not. So I said, I'm blowing a lot of money here. I need a full-time person that answers the phone. So I call Alexis, which is my first uh, virtual assistant. And I said, I need somebody that answers the phones and I'm going to train them. She got the person. Her name is Laika. She's still with me today. Great. And all my inbound calls come through Laika. And she is so trained now. She probably does it better than I do. She enters the data through Podio, and then she passes it to my U.S.-based team that then picks up the ball and moves from there. But at that point, I now freed myself from answering the phones, and we now had a process where we can now collect the data in a CRM so that we can follow up more importantly because the money's in the follow-up in any business. That's right. And now we're rocking and rolling even better. And now so, the beautiful part here is you've trained somebody to deal with your data. You've trained somebody to take your leads. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to take 200 calls in a day if you wanted to, not saying you want to, but maybe you can take 200 calls in a day, or you can hire somebody to take 200 calls in a day, or you hire three people and take 600 calls in a day, or you hire a hundred people and take 10,000 calls in a day, whatever it is. Exactly. It becomes a numbers game. So guess what the next place I fired myself from? I no longer wanted to make these calls every day. I just wanted to go to the appointments. So now I hired, Alexis hired Paul, which is still with me today. And he now makes 600 calls a day because wow. we use technology. Fantastic. Right? We use a triple line dialer and all that stuff like that. So now his sole, sole, sole focus, nine hours a day, is to do outbound calls. That sometimes turn into inbound calls, which Leica answers. So Great. now all I'm seeing is qualified leads where I need to have that initial pre-appointment call with them. Right? So you are the one, you Max are the one who, uh, who 
takes that pre-appointment call. That so all of those all those other things happen, and then you are the one who personally takes that pre-appointment call. Yep. Why are you? Why are you that? Why are you doing that? And I I'm not trying to lead. I'm just going to say what I think. I could just even tell from your 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 podcast the way the way you work, the different things you've done that just building that relationship is so absolutely Mm -hmm. crucial. I'm just going to answer the question for you because it's so evident from your personality. So evident from just the way, you know, the way you come across on your YouTube channels and everything else that establishing that you is that first point of contact and building that trust, building that rapport, building that, that information gathering together and building that trust. I really think that serves you incredibly well in your business. I appreciate it. And, and that's, that's it. It's twofold. So one, I want to introduce myself to the customer um, and really get real boiled down to see if I can really solve a problem before I waste my time and their time going to their house. And then I also establish that rapport with them. And now we're going to say, hey, you've talked to my associates. They, they got you here. I'm the guy that's going to come to your house. Let's just have a quick conversation. And now, okay, great. The appointment's tomorrow at two. I'll see you tomorrow at two. So I was still that bottleneck. Yep. I was still that bottleneck, but I didn't have to do all these other things. So now my time is spent real carefully on generate uh, revenue generating activities. Yep. I am now, I only do the things that generate revenue, which is now going on these appointments and getting these contracts. Okay. So and, now you have four people in your business. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt there. No, go ahead. You've got four people in your business. You have somebody that's dealing with the data while you're sleeping. You have somebody who is making outbound calls for you, Mm -hmm. basically generating leads. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is taking inbound calls. So somebody who is is doing the the lead Mm follow-up. And you, you're taking appointments and actually negotiating deals. So we've got four people in your business right now. Mm -hmm. You're doing, it sounds like, a whole lot more... Uh, uh, transactions, touches, uh, lead generation tasks with a whole lot less of your time. Correct. So you're, so, you're heading in the right direction here. Yeah. So I'm utilizing, I'm, I'm taking advantage of the U.S. currency with the great workers and the great work ethic that people have in the Philippines. And I am now maximizing my dollar and finding great employees at the same time. How so much wh- are you paying them? Um, so each one is a base salary of around two to two twenty a week, okay. which is double the, the salary of an average person that works in the Philippines call center for an American company. That's awesome. Win-win. So we pay great and we do bonuses as well. So now I'm consistently doing 20 or $30,000 a month and I have a team, but I also have some freedom at this time now. That's nice. So now I have to do CEO, 30,000 foot level stuff. I need to figure out how can I go out and spend time in the evenings between five and seven and meet new buyers? What, what networking events can I go to versus crunching data at night? What networking events can I go to and meet new buyers and find out what they like and find out what they don't like? And that's what I was doing. Excellent. Generate more and more and more. So what other networking things are you doing in addition to physically going out? For example, I know uh, we talked a little bit about your YouTube channel. You talked mm-hmm. a little bit, bit about your vlog, which I still have the hardest time saying that vlog. Me too. Vlog, right? <laughs> Who came up with vlog? It's not a real word. Vlog. You get the merch and you smash <laughs> the like button and all that. It's just fascinating to me. This whole new crazy world. I love it. But what are some of those other things that you're doing? from to, to really build that brand even more, to take on that 30,000 um, mm-hmm. high level view, to really be the CEO, to really grow your business. What are those things that you're spending your time on now instead, instead of answering the calls and crunching the data and all the stuff that you did back in the day when you were first growing? That's a great question. So one of uh, a person that I look up to and have for four years now is, is Gary Vaynerchuk. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually just had him speak at my event, which is like crazy that it's awesome. a very short amount of time. But uh, Gary talks about building a brand for yourself. So I actually brand me more than I brand my company. Um, so that whatever I decide to do, I am the brand. So whether I want to sell peanut butter and jelly sandwiches tomorrow, or I want to keep doing real estate, the brand follows me. I would totally eat a Max Maxwell peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> Just for the record, I can probably sell the start crap making it even more than now. That'd be amazing. <laughs> no words. So, so, so do oh it. Oh my God, so. I so didn't mean it like that. People, <laughs> gentlemen, come on. This is a family show. This is 
the what family show. What's happening here? So, you know, just just uh, building your personal brand and becoming that authority figure is, is important to going out and finding. Uh, it's actually helped me find a lot of cash buyers, people that trust me and see my work ethic visually and hear it. They know that I'm trustworthy by listening to me and following me. It's helped me get some of the best employees that I can because they trusted my brand. They believe in me. Um, so building that personal brand is, is a big side, a big uptick of uh, growing your actual business. I started hosting free meetups. I started telling people locally in my community how to do the same thing I was doing. And a lot of guys are like, you're creating competition. No, you're seeing it wrong. You look at the big, big picture. I'm creating an army of people that are willing to learn and may even come to me and bring me deals. Absolutely. And uh, that's how you look at it, you know? So, and we've, we've done deals. I'm doing a deal tomorrow, making like 25,000 with somebody that is locally in my market. Isn't that great? So you're out there and it's just all self-perpetuating, right? You're yep. keeping, you're keeping yourself out in front of people. You're, you're helping people learn how to do this on their own. You're changing lives. Mm-hmm. And in return, and it's, it's a byproduct, but it all just works very organically, right? It's just people, are, people continue feeding you deals. So it's like you're putting good stuff out there, good stuff's coming back to you, and it just keeps growing and snowballing and becoming bigger and better. Tell us more about your conference that you just had. So I set a goal this year to put on a conference, the largest wholesaling conference, right? There's so many conferences about like apartment buying, uh, single family rentals, and um, I wanted to do something big. I wanted to put on the largest wholesaling conference, not just because of just to say I did the largest, but what would it feel like if we had 1,200 wholesalers, like-minded individuals in a hotel for three days? And just the atmosphere it created, we created a new family members. We created all types of things where, I mean, we now, you can now go back to your perspective area where you live, but you now have a family of 1,200 individuals across the country that are in the same thing as you. So we did that event, uh, two and a half, three days, and we had Gary uh, V as the, uh, the keynote speaker, uh, which was awesome. And we just met people and changed some lives and show people how this works and, and really help people scale their current business as well, too. So awesome. fun. Congratulations. Sounds like a huge success. Yeah. Awesome. So you now have a business, um, if I recall, um, I know your goal was $100,000 per month and you're doing that. You have, again, your, your, um, your data person, you have inbound uh, person, out, mm-hmm. uh, outbound person. You now have somebody who handles your, your, uh, your acquisitions and your dispositions. So uh, mm-hmm. actually working with buyers and sellers. Yep. So how do you decide where to spend your time in the business? What do you, how do you decide what the highest and best use of your time is? Um, the highest and best time for, for what I did. So I, I recently hired my older brother as my COO so I can spend more time on the road and out doing things and, and, and generating and meeting people. Um, my goal is not to be the biggest wholesaler in the state or this country. It's not, it's just not, it does, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. So I want to grow a billion dollar company and only way I can do that is going out and meeting other people. Now, it's going to be in the real estate field, of course, Um, but I need to go out as a CEO and be able to generate more things, learn, so I go to conferences to learn, so I can bring that back to my team, so we can grow what we have. uh, It's it's just a snowball, so my job is to make sure I get all the outside fluence and bring it into my company and grow something, finding new partnerships, um, finding people that I can partner with to create things. being in this business for a short time, not even three years, I see a lot of technology that needs to be developed. And I've linked with developers to where we created a business, to where we're creating softwares and we're creating tools that help real estate investors across the world. And so that's, so I, out of, out of wholesaling, the ATM machine, I've been able to create passive income. I've been able to actively go out and start new businesses. It's my vehicle to being an entrepreneur where I really have four businesses now just from learning how to wholesale. That awesome. is fantastic. One, I, I want to touch on, on one more thing is that um, I feel is, I was talking a little bit about just your building rapport and your mm-hmm. relationship building and so, fo- and, and so on and so forth um, that has been so successful in your business. And I think, I, I think another one of those 
uh, when we were asking about the things in which you spend your time, um, is it's just the whole your whole art of negotiation. And of course, that's a little bit near and dear to our hearts because we just we just recently released our book on negotiating real estate. Awesome, but, I got to read it. Well, I sent it to you. You could write okay, the book. Perfect, oh my gosh, are you perfect. kidding me? So we were, as we were, you know, watching some of your videos and so on, absolutely, which I want, I want you to talk, uh, you know, near the end of this, I want you to tell people where they can go to watch them. It is absolutely awesome how you document yourself on YouTube mm -hmm. doing full on negotiations so that you can see, uh, so that people can see how that really works and really the art of negotiation and the skill behind it. Where I want to know, where did that come from? How did you become such a good negotiator? Did it grow organically? Did you have a specific experience that led you to become a good negotiator? Is it, is it trial and error? Or what is it? What, I mean, what tips? Whatever. Tell, tell these listeners something about negotiation, why it's important in your business, a tip, whatever, because you are a stellar rock star at it. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Know. It did not come overnight. It's something that is really trial and error. Um, you learn some... So sales is pretty much the same across any industry. There's some very principled key foundations, uh, you know, like listening more than you speak, um, really trying to hear the customer, try to solve a problem. Those are some key foundations of what it is. And then you also got to have a hard line. Never be desperate when you're selling or buying anything, right? Um, and, and, and when you are desperate, it shows, it smells in people, it makes you very vulnerable. Um, so, and, and be honest, uh, if, if, if the numbers just don't work, it don't work. And people can appreciate that, that, Hey, look, it's a great house. Uh, just way too much for me. I mean, I can do this, but there's no way I can do this. And I respect that. But ne negotiation takes time. I, I say, put yourself and learn some key principles and it can be, you can learn how to sell cars or you learn how to go door to door for AT&T or whoever, whatever companies you want, but learning some key principles and then really being a people person. Like it, it's the difference of winning the deal is literally trying to understand what this person's objective is. What are they really trying to get out of this negotiation? You're solving a problem. That's it. What is the problem? Can I meet you somewhere? Can we, let's solve the problem that you actually want. And a lot of people say, hey, look, I want $100,000 for my house. Why? <laughs> what are you going to do with it? Right. And then you start to break down the problem and then you get to the underlying thing as well. You know, I need a new car and I want to get a, a boat. OK, what type of car? What type of boat? And these and then you start to realize well, you, you don't need 100. You need 50. That's all you really need. Let's yep. give you what you want. Let's get you what you want. And I'll give you a place. <laughs> Got a guy who'll get it for you. And, and you're making the negotiation about them. It's not about you. Too many people go into negotiations with this attitude. I want, I need, I'm going to get. It's not about you. No. If you give the other side what they want, what they need, what, what, what they're going to get, it'll come back to you. You'll get what you want. But you need to focus on them. People like things to be about them. And if you go in with that attitude, give me what I want, that's going to come through. So you go in with the attitude, I want to give you what you want. And that's, that, that'll, that'll, that'll be paid off in reciprocation. And, and never be afraid to walk away. Absolutely. Always walk that's away. That's it. Walk away. Just walk. And they always come back. Funny how that happens, right? Exactly. That's why I really say it. Really does. Really does. So what do you think, Jay? Is it time to do four more? I think we're going to do the four more. So Max Maxwell, we have four more questions for you. You ready? I'm ready. So what was the worst job you ever had and what lessons did you learn from that job? Oh man, the worst job I ever had. It was a combination, right? So this is going to be a sound little cliche. I think the worst job I ever had was United States Air Force. Really? Thank you for but your I, service, wow, by the way. Wow, thank you. But I enjoyed it. And is, does that make sense? And that's what I'm saying. It, it does, right? It's that double-edged dichotomy thing going on. Yep. I enjoyed, okay. I enjoyed the travel. I love the people I met. I love the lessons that learned me. But man, was it a terrible job. You know, jumping out of things, getting shot at, shooting things. It ain't really that great of a job. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at it that way. But it was, it was fun. Excellent. And, and you did that one for everybody else, not yourself. Correct. There, there you we go. Thank you. We thank you for that. So my question is, what is the defining moment where you realize that you really had an entrepreneurial itch? I think when I started, when I got jobs that I thought I wanted, um, when I got out of the military, 
I was turning down offers from other companies because I had a top secret security clearance. I, I, I was, I was leaving like a 24, $25,000 a year job and turning down 60, $65,000 jobs to chill, try something. And I think that's when I realized that, okay, I left this military for a reason. Let me fail my way to success. And, um, really being on the job and seeing the problems. If you ever work in corporate, you see problems that you just want to solve and you can't be quiet about it. And you go to your managers and the upper level and they're like, shut up and you can't. So it's frustrating and you have to leave because you can't sit and watch the problem just manifest in front of you. We have no idea what that's like, do we, honey? Yeah, no idea. What no, you're... no idea. Okay. So Max, there's a lot of bad advice that I hear in the real estate world and the business world. So can you give me an example of some of the worst advice you've been given or that you've heard uh, from other people with your real estate business or your, or your business in general and how you would correct that advice? Um, there's a few, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I think people misinterpret the fake it till you make it model. Love that. Um, yes. It, it, people take it as into like literally fake, uh, your presence or what people think of you. It, that's not what it means. It doesn't mean look like success before you were success. It means believe you are successful before you were successful. Do the things that successful people do prior to you getting there and faking it and believing that you are there already. So when you have a conversation with somebody, you show that confidence of that you believe you're there. And it's, so that's faking it to you making it. It's not saying go buy a Mercedes because that's what the top realtors drive, or it's not with top sales guys drive that. It's more of believing in yourself, faking it, like understanding, say yes, say yes more than you say no is believing uh, and, and faking it till you make it. So I love that. That's I love a really that. Good one. Really good one. And then I have the fourth question. What is something, Max, that you've splurged on, but it was totally worth it? Mm. Uh, a Lamborghini. Really? What? Yeah. What kind of Lamborghini? Uh, Huracan. Uh, my nice. my, my nine year old's going to be very, very jealous. <laughs> what color is it? Black. Sweet. And I don't even talk about it. That's it, awesome. It, it was better. something that was on my wall as a kid. And it was something where I wanted to get it. And it was nothing to do with I want to get it to show it off because you don't, nobody sees it. It's not on Instagram, it's not anywhere. Um, and it's just, it's just there because I always wanted it. I don't care if nobody ever knows I own it. I just wanted that. And that's great. We all need those, those signs, are, those reminders to ourselves that we've worked hard, we've earned it. And it's a good reminder that you need to get up tomorrow and you have to keep going. Yeah. Because the day you stop doing that until you've generated that, that cash flowing machine that's passive income, until that day, that car can go away or the next car is not going to come. So it's, it's a very it's, dumb purchase. I mean- I could have bought a, a performing asset, but it was, I was just, I had Something to get rid of Something you wanted to do for you. Good I got fun. rid of the itch. <laughs> Good for you. Okay, so, so that was the four. And so here's the more question. Where can people find out more about you? You know, I am, I'm all over the place. I'm very active on YouTube. I just hit 100,000 subscribers. Um, I'm on Instagram. Uh, just search Max Maxwell. There's a few of us out there, but I, I pop up first on YouTube, on Instagram, and all those other places. Go follow me, please. Uh, you know, tell me that you you followed me from this this uh, this podcast we're doing here, and I'll I like to respond to everybody when I'm on flights. But I just like to give because the the information that we have to us now, yes, it's readily available, but a lot of people still don't know that. So I'm trying to help other people change their family tree, like how I've changed mine. And you can, you don't have to be in love with real estate or entrepreneur, but get, do it so you can get what you actually want to do. You might, you might get into real estate just so you can start your nonprofit, you know, whatever it is, but go out and change your family tree. Cause it's up to us to, to do that. And, and nobody else. That's phenomenal. Max, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been absolutely awesome talking. I'm glad with to you. be here. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Max. We really appreciate it. And that is our show today. Carol Scott, what do you think? I really loved talking to Max. I thought he just had great energy and such a powerful message about when he was able to systematize his business to grow, 
That way he's able to teach other people to do the same. So ultimately they can change their lives as well. And when you think about it, that's really what we're all trying to do over here at Bigger Pockets. It's a great thing. So anyway, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Can't wait to see you next time. Have a great week, everybody.